about 20% of the total saving in 2050, we believe, will be down to hydrogen. So we do see uh, opportunities there, but again, it's longer term. The first aircraft, we don't see entering service till 2035, so it's quite a slow ramp up. Um, but then, as I say, as we get to 2050, we think for sure all there's a reasonable opportunity. So that's the kind of perspective. But yeah, if you want the details, there's a there's a 200 page roadmap on on the websites of those uh, uh, industry associations in Europe. You can you can have a look at. Okay. Anybody else want to add anything on that topic? All right. Let's talk about realistic timing. So we've we've kicked it around. Jonathan actually just teed it up. Just across the board, quick answers. Um, based on aircraft development cycles, timelines, these externalities, is Airbus's goal achievable in 14 years? Mark? Uh, it'd be significant, it'd be a significant challenge. Um, uh, you know, the, um, the first half of the challenge is designing of the aircraft. And, uh, you know, technically I assume they can do that. Uh, then you get into the whole certification program of it. And, Relative to safety, with uh, either high with high pressurized uh, tanks for the high fuel tanks and the fuel, when you compare hydrogen to kerosene fuel, is actually much greater because of the structural requirements of the fuel tank for the hydrogen. The hydrogen is much lighter. Um, but, but the fuel tanks, because the structural requirements have to be a lot heavier. Um, and all those things figure into crash worthiness and survivability. Um, and uh, so, so there are significant regulatory challenges, but based historically, again, I mentioned uh, aviation typically moves in evolutionary steps, not revolutionary jumps. And, um, and even those evolutionary steps, like something like the 787, which was a composite aircraft, Took, took years, uh, you know, the introduction of composites into aircraft took years to get through the regulatory process and get, get approved, again, because of the significant safety risk of, of new materials and structural components. So yeah, um, it's a very ambitious schedule. To and and yeah, and we've seen that actually in every new aircraft program where a new technology was introduced. It's always a, a driving factor, Airbus with new, a new material suite, et cetera. Uh, Michael. Um, yeah, I, th I think to be frank, it's a it's a stretch, uh, as Marx alluded to, to get there in the next 14 years. It would require a lot of things to fall into place um, uh, in a very short space of time, and it would require significant uh, financial investment. And as we know, we're not a, an industry which is uh, cash rich uh, at the moment or likely to be in the coming years. But but it, I think. Um, you know, we've seen in other areas, again, has been said, we've seen in other areas the ability for our industry to to make these milestone steps forward in, in the short in a short period of time. I mean, our first ever, just to draw an analogy, our first ever SAF flight uh, was 2000 and, uh, 2010, 10 years ago. You know, you, you imagine uh, in the years going up, coming up to that, I, I suspect people thought flying uh, large aircraft on anything other than um, existing jet fuel was complete pie in the sky um, fantasy. So um, I don't doubt our ability as an industry to take this kind of major step forward in, in what's a relatively short, short period of time. But as I said, it, it will require a lot of pieces to fall into place um, all at the same time. I mean, I really hope it's going to happen, but okay. it, it will be a stretch. All right. Uh, one other theme with respect to acceptability, you know, Airbus signaled uh, already to the government that uh, subsidy might be required on these aircraft because they would not be as efficient based on the issues that Mark described, higher volumes needed for the fuel tanks, et cetera. Um, Aaron, you want to comment or are airlines willing to accept a next generation aircraft that doesn't achieve double digit improvements in operating cost? Yeah, I mean, I think that's certainly the, the big challenge, Mark. Um, you know, in terms of, it's got to be a balanced approach. I worked for an engine manufacturer for a few years as well, not as uh, deeply involved as you, but, you know, certainly airlines don't want to have trade-offs. We want everything to be balanced and advanced together uh, in terms of performance, emissions, reliability, noise, and so on. Um, I think, you know, to this question of 2035, there's a big concern on my side around uh, competition for funding. And, and we've been talking through this a little bit. But, you know, governments in particular, um, 
when they look at decarbonization, one of the first things they look at is personal vehicles. Um, you know, and, and our cars have a utilization of one tenth of that of an airliner. Um, and the reason they like funding that is not because it's necessarily the best place and the most cost effective use of infrastructure, but because it wins votes. Um, and aviation in that respect is, is much less influential for votes and, and sw certainly smaller than the personal vehicle market. Um, so I think that's a, a critical challenge for us as well as how do we get uh, that actual funding to make that possible. Yeah, it's also yeah. worth pointing out that uh, road transportation uses about six, seven times the amount of fuel that aviation does worldwide. So uh, there is reason to focus there. Uh, Jonathan, anything else you want to add? Yeah, I mean, my perspective on it, we, we need everything. Um, I don't think there's any silver bullet for All aviation. Yeah. Uh, we, we need everything, but it's absolutely clear that the near-term priority is SAF. I mean, we've taken 10 years to get where we are. We're on the cusp of building these plants. So I'd hate to think that we lose all of that momentum that we've built. So I think that has to be the priority of the industry. But in parallel, we have to make sure that, you know, we continue to put in the R&D and funding to support these other technologies. Because while I, I am a massive supporter of SAP and think it's going to be a significant contrib contributor, it's not going to be the only solution. We're going to need, we're going to need everything. Yeah, so that's a great segue to our close. We just have three minutes left. So real quick, 10, 15 second answers. As an industry, uh, or, or where should uh, policy and investment be focused? Uh, can we afford an inward focus on hydrogen R&D when we still need assistance with SAP R&D and D to prevent uh, 15 year delay in, op in uh, operational decarbonization or any other comments? I'll just go down the list. Uh, Aaron? Um, I would say it's important to be focused on the future, but uh, you know, if you had to choose one on only one, I would say you'd better go that SAF route. Um, but decide in the meantime, is it electric or hydrogen? I don't think it's going to be both. Mark, I realize you're a federal employee. Any technical observations on policy and investment focus? Uh, I'm just going to mention relative to SAF, I mean, the, uh, relative to regulations and SAF, the transition is seamless. So from a regulatory perspective, that's clearly the answer. Um, anything else requires a lot of regulatory engagement and innovation. All right, Matt. Uh, where should we focus this year, next year, the next few years? SAF, absolutely. And, and that's because it's, it's, it's proven. We know it can work. We've got to scale it up and governments around the, the world need to pull the policies to do that. So I'll, I'll do it by time frame. The focus okay. now, very clearly SAF. All right, Christina. We are a long-term visionary organization, so I would say, like Jonathan said, it's a balance. There's no single bullet solution, and obviously the short-term solution is SAF, but we don't need, we need to look at decarbonization, taking stocks out of the atmosphere, and SAF has less potential than hydrogen in that sense but it has the biggest potential because it, it reaches the, the biggest part of the market. So both. Yep. I'm not Michael? going to choose one or the other. Super. Michael, final word. Yeah, I'd ra rather than um, time frames, I'd say it really depends on who, who's making the, the investment. You know, So for an airline perspective, I do agree. I think it has to be staff decisions made in the next 10 years are going to set us on our pathway to 2050. Maybe on the manufacturer side, um, they should be looking into more radical, the more radical technologies. But I do think we need to be looking at a range of things. Um, yes, SAF is going to be the bulk of our energy source, but it's going to come from other areas as well. So we need to keep working on all of this. Okay, super. I'll make a few closing comments until I actually shut off. So we outlined uh, that hydrogen is already important for the approach that we have today. Uh, for sustainable aviation fuels, uh, we need a fair amount of hydrogen and we're looking at uh, the value of, of green hydrogen for the production of SAF. Secondly, you know, like anything, we have multi-generational technology plans in aviation for every aspect of it. And SAF is no different. A, a next stage of sustainable aviation fuel development clearly can be PTL fuels. And that's where you see a step up in the need for a hydrogen, but immediately coincident with that step up in need, there are these societal or externality issues that we have to address with respect to how is it produced? Where do the, the resources come from to do that? Um, while we obviously